right, well, we'll go ahead and uh, get started here this evening as, uh, yeah, I like I alluded to, we are, for folks that are up here on the north end of Montana, it has been a, a wintry, wintry Thursday. And um, I said it as we did our welcome into, um, into this event yesterday in our newsletter, but we definitely have been thinking about everybody that's been out there fighting this as they're checking cows and having to bring calves in. And for folks that have been waiting to get seating going, it has been a, a challenging year and it's easy enough for us in the offices to say we're thankful for the moisture, but we're also not the people that are out there having to contend with mother nature as she brings that to us. So um, we appreciate those of you that are taking the time here to, to join us tonight as uh, we bring you what is our final Rural Resilience Webinar of 2023. And this is my first year doing this with the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. And it feels like I'm finally just starting to get the hang of it. And then this is, of course, the last one for the year. So I'll have eight months to forget about it before we bring this back to you again in 2024. And uh, it is the, uh, we have been doing this for a couple of years now. And it seems to really be working to have this format to do it here during the winter months. And so we fully intend to do it again in 2024. Um, with that, a little bit of a reflection, all of the webinars that we have hosted so far this year as part of the series are all recorded. They're all available on our Ranchers Stewardship Alliance YouTube channel. Angel's gonna drop that link into the chat right now so you can see that. It's a great place to go subscribe. You can find out then when we get any new content added to that. And tonight's event will as well be posted up into that YouTube channel. If uh, you know somebody that might enjoy it or if you're wanting to do a playback, that's something that you can do as well. And then a, a little bit of forethought, uh, we're constantly accumulating a collection of possible future speakers. And so if there's ever a topic or a presenter that you would like to share with us, somebody that you think would be good, maybe in this webinar type of a format, or maybe somebody in person, just let us know. You can email me. I am Haley Ship. I probably should have introduced myself at the start. I'm your uh, communications and outreach lead with the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. And it's my job to take those interests that you all have as folks that interact with us and make sure that we're giving you the correct content in what we're working on with RSA. So again, my email, info at ranchstewards.com. Org. You can also find that information on our website, which is ranchstewards.org. So this is where I typically start giving you the history of the organization. I will do a little bit of that, but we thought it was especially important tonight to sort of look forward to some of the exciting things that we are doing. Now, first and foremost, we are going to be launching the Ranch Stewards podcast. It'll start out as a monthly podcast this June, and we've got some exciting surprises up our sleeve, but the very first episode, we're going to just throw it back to the basics. We're going to feature RSA President Leo Barthelmus and Vice President Dale Viseth, and they're going to tell the story of how RSA formed, why it formed, what's made it so successful. We're launching into our 20th year this year as a nonprofit. So if you want to be the first in the know when we launch, you can sign up for our notification list. And Angel is putting that link into the chat right now as well. And for those of you that do like this webinar format, it's been very, uh, of course, something that really kicked into place as we had COVID going through, but it's been something that's proven to be a great platform for people to connect across several different areas as we've got Cascade, we've got California joining us tonight. We do have another webinar series coming up this June, and it's going to focus on basic ranch bookkeeping. And it's everything from learning what numbers you need to track, how to put together and read reports like a PL or a cash flow. If you're like me, sometimes you sit down with your attorney or your accountant and you don't know what they're saying at all. And so we're going to try to sort of meet the gaps there in those languages with what we're talking about. And then at the end, bring it all together so that you can figure out, okay, here is why I'm tracking this stuff. Here's why it's important. And here's how I track that all with my profitability. So it's coming up again, it's basic ranch bookkeeping, and it's going to be held from 7.30 to 8.30 the evenings of June. June 12th, 19th, and 26th. Angel's going to do our copy and paste magic again and drop that link into the chat. And all of uh, these links that we're dropping in as well can all be found on that main website. So we've got a lot more planned. I'm not going to take up too much more time about that tonight, but it does give me the opportunity to talk about how excited I am to be part of this group. It really is a group of movers and shakers. Now, 
I have been with Ranchers Stewardship Alliance since the start of September. And I'm sure a lot of you that are joining this webinar, once you get to be that person that's part of, of things in a volunteer capacity, which we often are in, in our smaller communities, you realize that there's a lot of groups that just meet to meet and they kind of just exist because they've always existed. And that is not what it's like with RSA. So I, I just think that it's something that's so important to say because this group is not that group that's sitting idle. So as we look at why RSA was founded with pressures from outside interests causing some unrest along with consistent challenges of ranching in an arid isolated region, RSA was dreamed into existence by a group of 30 plus ranching families in 2003, as previously mentioned, and if you're any good at math, that means we are celebrating our 20th year this year, and recognizing that a legacy of wise stewardship, be it in transitioning ranches, creating relationships, or ding, 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 the topic of tonight's webinar, caring for the land, it's kept this region of grasslands intact and these ranches in the ranching business. So that's all fine and dandy, but we wanted to know if you've ever wondered how much of an impact the decisions that you are making on your landscape landscape actually affect your ranch. And so that's where we're bringing in tonight's discussion. The proof is in the photo. And tonight's presenter is Rick Coughlin. Rick and his wife ranch south of Stanford, Montana. He grew up on a crop and livestock farm in Illinois. He graduated from Montana State University with a range degree and then spent the better part of 33 years raising a family and working for the NRCS in Culbertson, Baker, and Stanford. He's now retired from the NRCS, but Rick continues to be a trusted advisor to many in the ranching community, as well as one of the members and the board members for Ranchers Stewardship Alliance's board of directors. So how it's going to work tonight is that Rick is going to be presenting for a little while, then we're going to have a breakout question that we'll pose kind of um, midway through Rick's presentation. At that point, you'll have 10 minutes. You'll go into breakout rooms and you'll discuss this question. You'll come back, give us some of your answers. Then Rick's going to finish it up and we'll do a bit of a Q&A at that point. And start to finish, you shouldn't be with us for too much longer than an hour here this evening. So with that, Rick, it's your turn. Thank you, Haley. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Am I coming through okay, Haley? Can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Perfect. All right. 33 years sounds like a long time. I, I don't think that could possibly be right. Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. We're gonna talk a little bit about rangeland monitoring, pasture monitoring that I assisted with um, during those 30 odd years. Um, so a little context before we begin. Uh, 30 years ago, there wasn't near so much satellite imagery and uh, technology. Uh, originally, we were using pole barn spikes and crushed aluminum cans to mark our uh, permanent monitoring sites. So things have changed a little in 30 years, but just so you know, a lot of what you're gonna see was developed in a different time. So um, if you're doing your own and making improvements or you're about to start doing some monitoring, um, there's a lot of new things out there. So do a little research. All right, Martin, let's fire this thing up. Like college, you know, the first slide is always, well, if you thought you were in gardening class, you probably need to go down the hall. All right, Martin, let's fire it up. We'll do, we'll do gardening in a later webinar. We don't want to start you with the hard stuff. Flip that slide. There we go. So monitoring, there's really, there's really two main reasons you might do it. One is to protect yourself say you're on a, a lease land of some kind. And the other one is to actually improve what you're trying to do on the ground. Hopefully I can convince you that it's, it's always worth trying to improve what you're doing on the ground. Uh, protection takes care of itself if you're doing monitoring. And so for monitoring really to matter, you have to be willing to change. That's the bottom line. Go ahead, Martin. 
So in Alice in Wonderland, Alice wasn't sure which way she should go. And the cat says, well, if you don't care which way you go, then it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what you do from here. Monitoring's like that. You have to know what your goal is so that so that the monitoring you do is going to be helpful to you. Go ahead, Martin. And picking that goal helps change your perspective and how you see your ground and what you're going to manage for. Are you managing to keep out weeds? Or are you managing to improve the vigor and diversity of your grassland? It sounds simple, um, but it can change. It can change how you uh, attack the problem. Go ahead, Mark. The hardest part. It seemed like for all of us, the hardest thing was trying to figure out where is that spot. Where is that spot that we want to do this? It's going to give us the answer so that we know what to do next. And so my best advice is start small. Don't overwhelm yourself with a lot of, of places to monitor. Pick areas that represent larger acreages that you'll be willing to change your management to make the improvement. If you're monitoring a site that represents five acres out of 500, you're probably not going to be very interested, even if you find that, well, if we did something different here, we can make it better. You might not be willing to do it just to improve five acres. Okay. So, so pick spots that you're willing to adjust and that will make not only an environmental difference on your place, but an economic difference too. Go ahead, Martin. So like I started with, things have changed out on the rangeland and there's a lot of cool apps that you can use and all kinds of satellite imagery, uh, tools like rangeland analysis platform, many others. This slide is gonna to explain to you how we did the monitoring we did so that you can understand in the second half uh, of the presentation, we'll look at a lot of um, comparison photos so that you can see the changes we were able to affect because of the monitoring we did. Typically, what we did was we set permanent stakes in the ground 100 feet apart. We GPS a starting point. We'd take a landscape photo looking down the tape from each end kind of like this photo in the background here where you could see a ribbon of sky, but you're mostly seeing what the what the ground cover looks like. And then we did five ground cover shots down that 100 foot tape in between those two endpoints. And we did, took those in inside of a three foot frame so that we always had exactly the same perspective. And we centered that frame over whatever foot mark we were using. And because I helped so many different people, um, it was easiest for me to remember from year to year if we just picked, we went with five, let me back up a little. We went with five ground cover shots because originally we started doing three and I decided that that wasn't enough information um, to make judgments about if management was making a difference or not. And so after a couple of years, we, we bumped up to five ground cover shots in a hundred foot run. I felt like that was sufficient for us to make make the decisions we needed to make on on management. Um, so we had at each point, then we'd have two landscape shots and five ground cover shots. We'd take them annually. I like to do them late in July through the end of August in Montana. Um, that covers the end of our growing season. So typically on any ranch, I was able to see somewhere we came to a pasture that hadn't been uh, grazed yet. So you kind of get an idea what full growth looked like for the year, as long as we were that early. And it was early enough that there usually was still some green in the photos, which makes them easier to look into and tell what you're looking at. Um, obviously there's some years 
in July and August, there isn't any green, but um, typically there's a little bit of, of green there. What happens, it seems like in Montana, we're a little bit north, as you get later in the year, the sun gets low enough in the sky, you get a lot more shadowing in the photos and it's a lot harder to discern any kind of differences in them. So um, end of July, first part of August was, was my pick time. For the riparian areas, a lot of times we would just get on a, on a high bank. It might be that second terrace above the, the stream, say, and we'd shoot a photo up and down and directly across. If we could see a long distance and wanted to do um, have a little more photo coverage, then we might shoot two up and two down and one across. You'll get to see you'll get to see some examples of both these kinds of things. Along with the photos, we always kept grazing records and precip records. Without doing that, it's really hard um, later on to interpret if what you're seeing in the photo is changes because of weather or changes because of, of management. What we learned was far easier to see changes in weather. Management changes typically are slower and more gradual. Weather changes you can see from year to year, uh, especially if you kept your precip records. Um, and so as we gathered years worth of photos, we'd go back and compare over the years how things were changing. Okay, Martin, thank you. Which leads me to that this is the most important part. If, if you're going to do photos, if you're going to do line transect and, and drop pins and, and write down plants and that kind of thing, None of that will do you any good if you stick it in a book. You're gonna have a scrapbook. You have to take the time to compare your data over the years against your goals and then determine what kind of management adjustments you might need to make. When you've done all of those steps, that's when you're actually monitoring. Go ahead, Martin. All right, we have made it to Martin's breakout question. Martin, go ahead. I'll let you. Yeah, so we wanted to, to stop here before we go into examples. And um, just to make sure everybody's in a monitoring frame of mind, like a lot of times we work on projects or we make a ranch change and we don't have any data from before. Um, so is there a, an old picture you, that you guys have from your ranch or um, just some interest in knowing what something looked like before changes happen. And in groups, let's talk about what that what that action or what that landscape or what that spot would be. So Angel's going to work on separating us into a couple breakout rooms, um, and we'll go in there for a few minutes and then come back and join Rick's presentation. Okay, perfect. So yeah, guys, where would you look at for uh, what you want to take a picture of and see where the changes are? What kind of changes would you like to implement to see how that frame changed and discuss that amongst yourselves and then we'll come back. All right, looks like we're getting everybody's computers back in sync with our main room here. So we'll uh, continue on here just a second with uh, Rick's presentation. But as we get started back into the space, if you could let us know what you all decided individually would be the place that you would take a picture of if you were going to recreate one of these images. And uh, if you maybe had a place that you wanted to know what it looked like in the past, what would it be? And, and kind of give us some of your why to that, as well as maybe some changes that you might like to see. So again, if you could recreate a picture from your ranch or nor what something looked like in the past, what would it be? Go ahead and give me your answers there in the chat and we'll kind of throw those out to Rick. In, in fairness to the group I was with, we almost entirely ignored the question. My <laughs> apology, my apologies. That's, Martin is not surprised. And, uh, and that's, that's without having a beer for at least 48 hours. <laughs> we put it I, st no I, st I still couldn't follow directions. <laughs> 
So we've got a couple here, corral systems, conifer tree changes. I love Rick that you said, you know, obviously monitoring the, the weather along with it, because that's the big, the big asterisk to any of these things. How do you know when one year has seven inches of precip and the next year might have 12, but um, you know, and when that's most valuable, Haley, is when you're working with people who are non, uh, they don't spend a lot of time in the ag world and or they don't, like I came from the Midwest, um, people from um, the Midwest and East or the West Coast, they don't realize what the, not always there are some dry places on the West Coast, but typically don't realize how much difference a good year and a bad year, how much difference there is. And so having those photos and being able to show them and explain that, you know, it might look terrible out there, but like in these past two years, it hasn't rained for two years. We've had two years worth of grasshoppers and some people enjoyed some hail too. Um, so sometimes it's it's really eye opening to people to let them see what weather does. We were just having this discussion last night. I have a friend in Nebraska who has experienced drought along with ours, but they're not coming out of it yet in Nebraska. And then a friend in Iowa, and we were teasing her because her Iowa drought, she's still fishing in her stock pond. You know, it's it's all about perspective. So <laughs> we've got some other folks saying heavy use pastures through time. They'd like to take a look at stream banks, fires and trees, trees moving into rangelands. Patty says, I'd be interested of what my ranch looked like before the cattle and sheep came into the country. Sue says invasive weeds. Paul says, I would like to see what the ranch looked like before all the changes and then time lapse, lapse from beginning to present. And another one I'd be interested in what other grasses or forbs would have been growing where the crested wheatgrass and smooth brome are now growing. So yeah, those are all great points. The, the, tree, the tree response. Martin, do you know, do you guys in the office have, there was a... a... ARS release of, it was exactly what you're asking for. It was old photos. And then somebody went out, found those locations and reshot them. Um, so it's like a picture essay book from the ARS. Have you seen that? Do you know what I'm I've, talking about? Yeah, I've seen it. Um, I've found that, but at the, the end, I'm gonna throw in the link to that that um, satellite imagery one. Okay, because there, that, that particular bulletin was really incredible. It's amazing how much reforestation has occurred in this country since 1900. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, I know it was part of that report. Montana has lost as many acres of range production to trees as we have to farming or weeds in the last 30 years. That seems hard to believe. Yeah, and for folks that are interested in that, we do have some literature as well on our website, again, ranchstewards.org, um, kind of talking about that with Dusty Emond. I don't know if he's on the call tonight, but some of what he's seen on his place. So yeah, definitely something that we're continuing to see impact producers in our region. All right, Rick, it looks like you can take over now and, and kind of go back into showing us what your pictures look like. Okay, uh, this is where they're rubber meets the road, I guess. Um, so a little context. First thing is, a lot of times we don't realize how much control we have. Um, I don't know how many of you that are, are watching tonight have been on the same place for very many years, but a lot of times as I went out and worked with people, they'd look out the kitchen window and they'd say to me, well, what difference does it, make, does it make that that view has looked the same for the last 50 years? I've looked out that window for 50 years and nothing has changed. There's a reason nothing changed and it was because the management never changed. We didn't know when we, this set of slides that you're about to see next, there's nothing magic about them. We weren't smarter than anyone else. 
We had no idea if we could change anything. Go ahead, Martin. We didn't know if the management changes we were proposing would change the things the way we wanted. The only thing that we did know was that we wanted things to be better. And so we set the monitoring up there and did it annually like we talked about at the beginning. And you're going to see, I don't know, a set of a dozen slides here now. Um, this is gonna be my grazing management, 30 seconds for grazing management. Uh, if you live in Montana, I heard one Wyoming anyway, maybe Northern Colorado, right now is the, in my opinion, the most critical, critical time on your grazing land that you have all year as far as having an impact and being able to allow recovery. Between now and let's say the up here in Montana, um, the 15th of June, that's when our grass really is gonna grow if it's gonna get to grow at all. And so I'm not telling you now is the time not to graze. I'm for grazing every day of the year. What I'm telling you is now is the time to manage the heck out of your grazing so that you can allow as much growing re season recovery and growing season means these 60 days that we're currently in as you can. So that means use it. Uh, trying to, I'm trying to find the right word. Use it fully, allow it, get off of it quick and allow it to recover and don't go back to it until it has. So this is the same fence line. Um, there's a creek down in the bottom that cows don't like to walk up and down that steep hill. So they made a path along the fence that was on Memorial Day weekend or whatever that particular year. And on July 4th, six weeks later, it had re that pasture had received um, approximately an AUM of use an acre, that's a pretty good riparian pasture, but by May 25th, this is uh, central Montana, 4,600 feet elevation. Um, it had, had had left, we'd left the grass from the year before on it. Um, and so that was basically what they were grazing was old grass from the year before and whatever green was underneath of it, because at that elevation, we don't have a lot of growth by the 25th of May probably four or five inches. Um, and you can see the recovery, the purple stuff in the right-hand side is alfalfa. That was left standing that pasture then until the following spring. Um, you're gonna see this pasture again. It was receiving a certain kind of treatment um, for the riparian area. Go ahead, Martin. Okay, so this set of photos, um, this is you're looking down into the three foot frame. Um, we have a board up on the backside that gives us the name of the producer, the pasture, the footmark that we're on um, so that we could tell when we looked at the photos, what photo we were actually looking at. So this is native rangeland, um, central Montana. They've been using it every year in May and June largely for the 60 important days that we were just talking about because of a water situation. And there was a intermittent stream that ran in that pasture um, in May and early June. And so that's when they used it. And they used it like that year after year. Um, the producer developed some water and a little bit of fencing. Go ahead, Martin. And in give or take 10 years, without really changing the amount of use it received, just when it received it. We took a fringe sagewort club moss dominated community and made it at least look like short grass prairie again. Probably the difference in those two photos of, I don't know, five or 600 pounds per acre production. Go ahead, Martin. Crested wheatgrass. I've got to get my glasses on so I can see that photo better. Okay, so up in the upper left, you can see a prickly pear cactus. You can see a lot of bare ground and a big rock. Um, I almost got my shadow out of the picture. So this is back in the old, old days. We're using carpenter squares for the frame. 
and paper for the photo marker. Go ahead, Martin. This thing was getting used hard again for most of the 60 days. And I said, even Crested Wheat can't take that, you guys. And 10 years later, um, given, the, given that pasture a little bit of rest, use it 30 days instead of 60. You, you can't even see hardly the rock is, we're not quite perfectly squared over it. The rock is still down in the bottom right hand there in the, uh, there's some silver leaf scurf bee there kind of covering it. And the cactus is basically gone. And so that, again, like I say, on dry land sites, it takes a little while of the same management. We were taking pictures every year. So full disclosure, high grade city, right? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not boring you with all the stuff in between where you're going, damn, then I look so good. It takes a little while to uh, see things improve. But like for this guy, the important thing was in 2001, if it looked like that on July 24th, what did it look like on May 24th, the next year? Almost exactly the same, right? Not much grazing there that you're dumping cows in on. But what about 10 years later? That, that picture is going to look a little bit better on May 24th the following year. And there actually be some vegetation, probably some green growing stuff in there too, uh, underneath all that old stuff. Go ahead, Martin. More spring recovery time. Spring was, a, it's the hardest time for people. Um, they're, uh, especially in Montana, where typically we're calving March and April. When we do that, we're getting snow like we have been the last few days. And so you've got to keep cows close. Um, so those first few pastures are always, usually closest to the house and they get used the same time every year, year after year. And it's during those important 60 days and they're typically getting used more than um, they can tolerate. They just don't get enough recovery time. This is more crested wheat. There's some intermediate wheat grass in this stand too. Um, what the heck year does that piece of paper say? 2001, go ahead, Martin. So that's 17 years later. Long time, right? And what we did, there were some springs in that 17 years, it never got used. We'd skip it. We'd, we'd let that crested wheat and that intermediate grow. And there's a little bit of alfalfa in there too. And come back to it in mid to late June or July even just allow those plants to go all the way through their growth cycle, replace all the roots and their root reserves. Um, and I suppose that happened maybe three times in those 17 years where we didn't even use it in May or early June. Um, but those are the kind of commitments it takes and the kind of time it takes. But you can see the production. Those are exactly the same squares, you guys, on exactly the same transect. And I don't have this individual's photos, but he has every photo from every year in between 2001 and 2018. Go ahead. Okay, so now this is going to be a set of four. Um, managing annuals. I, I can't speak for everyone because we've got people scattered all over tonight. Um, cheatgrass and Japanese brome are two um, annual bromes in Montana that can invade on rangeland and they're problematic because um, they will use up a lot of our early spring moisture and they'll create a lot of shade and all that brown stuff you see in this photo is cheatgrass overstory. There's probably a thousand pounds an acre of cheatgrass and then there's some fringe sagewort there on top of our native rangeland and that is August 16th, 2007. And so what we wanted to do was, was manage for our perennial grasses to come back. And so in order to do that, perennial grasses, we already talked about, really need rest and recovery time during those important 60 days in the spring. 
But cheatgrass and Japanese broom, that's when they're growing too, right? They start a little bit earlier, uh, up here at least, um, usually, maybe not this year. I was out looking at some of my own today. It's down there. It's looking a little purple yet because it's getting 20 degrees every night. But in the next 10 days, it will be two or three inches tall. And so our plan was monitor this pasture. When the cheatgrass gets two or three inches tall, turn the cows in on it. Keep them in on it until they have it grazed down and start to switch over to where we felt like they were starting to graze the native plants and pull them out. This is a small pasture, like 350 acres. And so 10 days later, if it had been moist enough and the cheatgrass had regrown to two or three inch height again, we'd put the cows right back in for just a short time, three, four days, let them graze that cheatgrass off. What we were trying to do was keep it from making seed. Cheatgrass seed only lasts in the soil. 98% of it um, germinates in the first year following uh, the year it was grown and the last 2% in the second year. So if you can keep cheatgrass and Japanese brome from making seed two years in a row, you've really put a dent in the seed bank. So that's what we were trying to do. Early hard hits in the spring, pull them off and let the perennials come through. So that second photo is 2008, same exact square. All the old gray stuff is cheatgrass laid down flat. The green stuff is Western wheatgrass, a native perennial rhizominous grass um, that everybody's listening. Um, you guys, I know you know that you all have it. You do, Colorado, Washington, Wyoming, wherever you're at. Um, so in our first photo, I truly that year, I couldn't, it was the first time I'd ever been on this individual's place. I couldn't tell if there was any perennial grass there or not. It was impossible to tell. So we were really encouraged by this second year. So Martin, go ahead and let's see what 2009 looks like. So we're still doing that same treatment and we did get some grazing even on some of our native, but it's looking pretty decent in 2009. And by 2010, you don't see cheatgrass in that photo. Four years, four years. It's not perfect, cheatgrass is gonna come back, but we do have a way to use it and to manage it. And we can minimize the time that cheatgrass um, takes over our rangeland. That one of the problems with cheatgrass um, in really wet early spring years, it's real productive. And during a short period of time, you can get a lot of use out of it, um, but it's a really short period of time and it really, um, reduces the amount of growth you'll get on your perennials. It just uses up too many of the resources, the water and the nutrients. Go ahead, Mark. Managing weeds. Our group talked about this a little bit. This is in one of my own pastures in 2005. The yellow weed is curly cup gumweed. Uh, right over the horizon, not the far horizon, the close horizon, there's a draw. In the bottom of that draw is a dam. Um, this is a lease pasture that I had. And I'd like to say that I inherited this problem. I found out when I started to research, I was gonna spray the curly cup gumweed out because I picked up the lease in 2003 and in four and five, it kept getting worse. And it was making me sick. And I'm not a spray stuff out kind of guy but I didn't know what else to do. And when I did research on curly cup gumweed, I found out it was a five or six year lived perennial. It wasn't a long lived perennial at all. So I did a little math in my head and I thought, well, this stuff shouldn't last too long. Maybe if I just take care of my grass, it won't, it'll fill in the bare spaces and the curly cup gumweed seed won't have a place to germinate and I'll be able to reduce my problem without using any chemical without spending any money. 10 years later, same exact spot, same transect. So um, so this, when I talked at the beginning about the landscape views, one from each end of the tape, that's what you're seeing here. We're looking, we're looking east down the tape here. Now, full disclosure, cur curly cup gumweed does come back. 
I've never had it come back um, as severe as what you see in the 2005 photo. I thought maybe it never would come back. It hadn't in 2015, but it had. It did after that, um, probably half as much. So that seed source is always there. And these last two years um, were dry enough, opened up the canopy a little bit and those uh, curly cup gumweeds did get a foothold again. Don't worry about them now. Now I know that I can handle it. I just have to make sure. So what I did again, I worried about the 60 important days. Those cows were going down to that reservoir to drink. They would come up on this little ridge and lay there all day. And so this air, this pasture just, it would get, if I used it early, I used it for a very short time, early June or late May. And uh, then I would let it rest until middle of July or later. And it seemed to do the trick. Go ahead, Martin. All right, so now we're looking across the fence that that first grazing recovery picture was down into the creek bottom. And Paul, you said you wanted to see a bad one. This might not look bad from your perspective, I don't know. But down in that bottom is a perennial stream. It's about 18 inches deep and three or four feet across is all. Um, you can't drive a four wheeler through it when there's any kind of water in it because it's too steep and and you'll hang yourself up. And in that photo, over the just to the right of the left-hand fence post, you can see three bushes. Those are three hawthorns. Uh, hawthorns a native bush here in central Montana. Gets a little apple on it. They have big long thorns. Um, those are the only three shrubs in the pasture in 2003. This was a year that I got the lease. That pasture had been used year after year after year um, during calving season up till like the first of June. So that meant end of March, April, May. So it was probably getting 75 days of use every year right right through the heart of the best growing season. Go ahead, Martin, click that. So 10 years later, all that green stuff down there isn't leafy spurge. Those are sandbar willows. Um, there wasn't a willow to be found for three years. And I was trying to chase a pear out one day and something hit the handlebars of the four-wheeler. I went back and looked and it was the very first willow and it was 2005. In 2014, beavers moved in. Um, it's an incredible beaver wetland complex down there now. Um, the nice thing about riparian areas is they change quickly enough that you can really show um, differences in a hurry and it encourages you to keep trying. And what we did here was um, we'd come in early 5th of May, 10th of May, it felt like we were doing the opposite of what I was told to do when I was in college uh, about how to take care of a riparian area. We came in early and fast. We took our AUM and acre off. We wouldn't come back. And at that elevation, most of the growing season at, was still to be had after Memorial Day. Um, we were probably only into the growing season about 10 days on the 25th of May. So um, we just let it stand and we come in the next spring. Okay, I think this is our big finish. Like we talked about looking out that kitchen window and it looked the same year after year after year. This, this fella who is a friend of mine now, um, the first year, he, he started monitoring because of a conservation security program contract he had with the NRCS. He sent his wife out with me to do the monitoring the first year. Um, this is year two, and those are his shoes. You'll see him again. And the second year, she made him come out with me. He didn't think it was going to be worth his time, but we set this transect up here because he knew this was a terrible pasture 
and and he said it should be better than this and he's right it should have been it's on a nice big flat bench near moccasin montana one of the more productive farmland areas in montana and it's curly cup gumweed and fringe sagewort and a little bit of blue grandma and some prairie june grass and a lot of bare ground right and so he wasn't very happy and he spent the time with me and what i learned with photos is is that it takes about three years before people really before you can see enough change that you really start to get people's attention and they realize doing something different might actually be working and i said to him i said on this august 16th i said uh, so how do you usually graze this and he says well we we go on usually around the 10th of may and uh if we were all together in a room, I'd ask you to answer this next question. I'm not going to have you do that now. I would ask. So then the next question was, well, when do you come off of this pasture? And you know what his answer was? His answer was, well, well, when the grass is gone. And I said, yeah. <laughs> I didn't laugh. I didn't say anything rude. I, but I did think to myself because by now it's. 2010. So as you can tell from those other photos, I've been doing this for a while now. And I thought, man, I have this guy right where I want him. I know we can make this better. Right. And so I said, well, let's try some things. I think we're going to have to give it a little. I said, we can use it a little in the spring. We just can't keep doing this or it's not ever going to get better. It's going to get worse and worse. And this is pretty bad. Go ahead, Martin. Nice work, Martin. Nice work. This is that same frame, you guys. What year is that? Say 2015, five years. Five years. The man didn't even want to come out and help with the monitoring. Now he calls me. Years later, he calls me and asks me when I'm coming to take his pictures with him. Um, anytime we do the photo monitoring, we always have good conversations. Um, they're really valuable. I, I learn a lot. I learn, I learn more from the people that I worked with than they learned from me, I'm sure. It was a heck of an education. Um, he made incredible improvements. And at the bottom of that slide, I don't know if you caught it, but it said, and I know you've heard it before, the hardest thing to change is your mind. I have to use that pasture. It's springtime. It's got crested wheatgrass in it. End of story. Um, until you can until you can recognize that there's a different way to do things, it's pretty hard to uh, believe that there could be an improvement. So now, once you get it to this, and it took me a while before I got to these, you know, right? You know, well, now what do we do? It's always a producer decision. How much more time are you going to spend on management? And he got to this point simply by the first year we didn't graze it at all in May or June. The second year in 2011, um, I believe I let him in. Not that I had any control over it. I recommended to him that he keep the cows out until after the 5th of June. And we did that for a couple years. And I by the by the fifth year, that photo, it had actually been grazed. It had been grazed. What year is this one? 18. This has been grazed. This has been grazed. And so at this point, then you have to start thinking about, well, if you want to improve it more, maybe you start uh, experimenting with a little bit more intensive grazing and some stock density and see if you can make some improvements that justify your time and expense. Um, or maybe you reach the point where you say, you know what, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go into maintenance mode on this one, and maybe you have a different spot that you want to work hard on. But anyway, I think that's what we have for those kind of, for my kind of photos. Martin, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to share one. Um, just as a, an example of recreating a historic photo, 
On the right is a picture of Beaver Creek on um, what's now my uncle Dusty's ranch from about 1977. And on the left is that picture recreated in 2022. Um, this almost shows something going in reverse, but the fun of this is that picture of this going in reverse is now what's driving the management decisions of this creek bottom. Um, I also like using this series of pictures. The only reason this picture exists on the right is because it's a before picture um, of my grandpa dynamiting this beaver dam. So I also get to play a part-time wildlife biologist. I like um, putting those pictures in my, my wildlife biologist PowerPoints. But uh, in this one, you can see um, willows and snowberries and everything else uh, that have greatly reduced in here. There was floods in the 80s and ice jams that basically shredded the, the willow population. And for 30, 40 years, they just did not re-sprout. Um, management of on the creek didn't help, but it's it's every ranch for 30 miles in each direction lost willows and trees in that flood. And they haven't re-sprouted and haven't come back. And Dusty and three other neighbors along this area are now working on basically trying to do things that keep water in the creek long enough that willows can get sprouted and going. Um, and I think Dusty's up to four beaver dams and eight or nine little willow sprouts, even through a 2022 drought. Um, and his comment on this picture versus this picture is we dynamited this beaver dam because we had too much water. Um, now we complain about not having enough water. So maybe we should go back to stuff that led to us having too much water. Uh, so that's a fun one uh, from my family's ranch. There's a bunch of other pictures I know I'd like to recreate from it, from creek bottoms to krells to pastures to fence configurations to all kinds of different things that I think would be fun to see again alongside of um, this ranch and many others are in monitoring programs that uh, ranches and if I'm helping them I try to keep up on with them just doing that that on the ground monitoring uh, like Rick showed in in narrow focus and then trying to do broad monitoring or scenery monitoring or some other things that just like show off ranch changes through time basically with just a different a different view and a different lens um so we had an idea that we wanted to run with here at rsa of if there's pictures from your ranch like that and you'd be be willing if you can recreate those pictures and find a way to either send them to us or if you're a social media person and you post them if you can use this hashtag rsa picture this um we will <laughs> share your photos as examples and show off something that you're either proud of or working on at your ranch that you wanted to see a before and after on. Uh, so that's just a little fun side to this. Um, we're going to go to questions next, but I think I have to stop. Angel, can you throw that link in the chat that I sent you earlier? Uh, I wanted to make you guys aware of one, one tool on this historic imagery thing that Angel's going to throw in the chat to everyone. Um, some of our RSA stuff and some videos have talked about the rangeland analysis platform, and I'm I'm not going to go into that. It's a whole different whole different kind of monitoring than this. This is fine scale, and rangeland analysis platform is broad scale at best. Um, but they made a tool within it, and if this link works for you guys, or if it doesn't, if you can go to the rangeland analysis platform and then to partner tools and then historic imagery. Um, they basically took original War Department aerial imagery that was done from planes and nerds that know how to do this then match that up with current satellite imagery. And you can take a slider bar and go back and forth between imagery that's from probably the 1950s versus today. Um, my screen switched to this. <laughs> I'll play with this for just a second to show you one that just blows me away. Uh, and I know Bud's on here, so this will be a fun one for Bud Walsh to see. We go to Zortman in South Phillips County, and we look at trees. Today, it's pretty well treed in. It didn't used to be. And so that's a fun tool just to go look at how ranches have changed through time. It's also fun to go look at like Bozeman or Billings and see how uh, town development has changed in that time too. 
but uh, just seeing what different things have looked like through time, trees versus stream banks versus really anything that might have changed. I mean, you, know, you can see right here, this is a straight line that was used to fill that reservoir and it's kind of channeled out in that time. So it's just fun to go slide back and forth and see just a, the changes you wouldn't necessarily see on the ground, but related and kind of large scale that you can see kind of ranch wide. So that was, that was the last thing I wanted to share. So I believe we are to the question and answer portion of today. I knew there was tequila in there somewhere before we got to end tonight. So um, I do want to recognize Martin Townsend. We did not introduce him at the start, but Martin works with us at uh, Rancher Stewardship Alliance. He technically is under the Pheasants Forever umbrella, but he is our conservation coordinator with RSA. And then we also have Angel DeVries, who we've been calling on to run some of the things in the background tonight. And she is our executive director and has been on each of these rural resilience calls with us. So thank you to, to those two for always joining in and uh, making this event even a little bit more fluid than uh, Rick and I may have had it tonight. So thank you to Martin and Angel. With that, yeah, we will go ahead and turn it over to question and answer. I do wanna say um, Angel is gonna be dropping into our chat a follow-up, a post survey after this event. And we want to know what you guys think. You know, do you like this time of the day? Do you like the topics that we're picking? Do you have other suggestions? We've been toying with the idea of maybe doing some webinars early in the morning while you can do it while you're drinking your first cup of coffee. Let us know if things like that might work for you because again, this is why we do this sort of thing is to make sure that we're providing quality content to the people in a good format that you all want to utilize. So the chat is open for questions with Rick. And Rick, I'm just going to open it as people start dropping their questions in, in that I don't have this educational background in range sciences. I'm a communications major with a, you know, just ranching background as in I did what dad told me to do. So when you start doing some of this plant ID and all of that, it's, it's a lot to take on for somebody that doesn't know, I mean, you can recognize crested, but you start identifying these other things and it's just over your head. So do you have a basic place where people can get started as they're looking at the pros and cons of different grasses and starting to explore some of these different strategies? Boy, I wish you'd have prepped me. Um... <laughs> Go to college. <laughs> uh, actually, you guys, um... I think, I, depending where you live, you have some pretty excellent two-legged resources around you. In the Malta area, Martin is one of them. Um, Kelsey Malloy is an excellent plant person. Um, find yourself someone that knows some and, and take them for a walk with you on your place. That is the best way to start. Um, there are apps out there for grasses, shrubs, forbs by state um, that you can take your camera and go click and take a picture. Um, Google, uh, Google Lens, free. You can take a picture with Google Lens and it may not exactly tell you what plant you're looking at, but it's going to get you close most of the time. Um, so I've got a question here, Rick, and it's um, a question from Vicki, and it's, you mentioned club moss and bare grounds. What is the best way to fix it? <laughs> um, the best way to fix bare ground is with cover, right? And at first, don't worry about what it gets covered with but especially in, in the dry West, um, if we don't put some kind of mulch on it, it's hard to get any seedlings to germinate. Bare ground gets awfully hot and dry. It's a pretty inhospitable place for a seedling. And so the first, in, the easy fix for bare ground is cover. Grow something so that, and how do you, and how do you make cover? <laughs> if it's really bare, it might take a couple of years, but you've got to let, you've got to let whatever will grow, grow for these next important 60 days. Then after that, you can go graze it. 
if you graze it all away, then you're not going to leave yourself any cover and you won't have gained any ground. Um, but typically, grazing animals are pretty selective. And if you allow the plants to go to maturity, um, when you turn them out to graze, you will get litter left on the ground. Club moss. Vicki, for you guys, I was actually walking across some of my own today um, thinking that it needed to be a little bit wetter. We didn't get as much moisture as you guys did up north. Um, I don't know how everyone else did around the country. Um, this time of year actually I think is a good time to impact club moss um, and especially in Phillips County right now in the next week or two, um, I would be feeding on it. Uh, be careful what kind of hay you feed on it because whatever seeds in that hay is going to grow wherever you feed it. But the intent is not to uh, find a new place to feed the cows. The intent is to get them tromping on that club moss when it's this wet, they'll tear that mat apart. Club moss is a native plant. It's supposed to be there. There are places where we have way too much of it. And the high line in Montana is one of those places um, where it's just, it's just went way overboard. Um, so what you can do to disturb that um, Club moss cover will help a bunch. Western wheatgrass, thick spike wheatgrass, Sandberg bluegrass, prairie june grass, um, they'll all start poking through it if we can punch some holes in it. The easiest time to punch those holes is right now when it's, when it's so wet that we're mucking around and getting stuck. So Paul in Seiko says on these pastures that you showed, did you open graze one AUM per acre or mob graze them in tight bunches? If it was mob uh, grazing, what pounds of impact? So that uh, that mob grazing wasn't a thing until a few years ago, right, Paul? Um, it wasn't a term anybody ever used or a technique that anyone ever tried. So um, it wasn't mob grazed, but typically we ran about two pair per acre on it, okay? So that would be say 3,000 pounds an acre. And I think mob grazing they say is at least 500,000 pounds an acre. So long, long ways for mob grazing. And we'd leave them on there for a week to 10 days, maybe 12 days, depending on the year and how much vegetation was there. Um, you never take it down slick, but typically in that situation they won't. We were that's pretty good growthy riparian habitat. So there was probably 2000 pounds an acre of material there when we turn them on in May and most of it was old material. And so when we would pull them off, there was probably 800 pounds an acre still of material there on the ground. I mean, you really, when you start to, when you start to let plants grow and become more mature before you turn in, Grazing animals, typically, you really have to work them to get them to graze it back down to bare ground. I mean, they're going to look like Earl's cows from the Earl cartoons. <laughs> yeah, So that's kind of how we did that. Not We've got Rose intense. over in Cascade, and she wants to know, how are drones playing a role in range monitoring? Hi, Rose. I'm glad you're on. I haven't seen you for a while. Um, so... If those of you who know of Greg Simons, and I don't remember the name of Greg's business, Open Open Range, Open Range Consulting, Greg has used a little bit of, of drone. He, as a matter of fact, his is the drone stuff that I've seen. Um, I would guess there's probably a lot of individuals. I know people, I have friends that have drones. I don't know if they've used them much for um, monitoring. The, the thing with the drone, and I don't know much about them, is the, the stuff I've seen is video clips. And so it works really good for um, riparian areas or maybe if you were looking at tree cover or sagebrush cover. But if you were out on just grassland, um, drone coverage probably wouldn't be very valuable to you. Uh, I guess maybe there's really good drones that they can stop and take still photos and you can get pretty nice 
um, shots into grassland. I mean, for the shot to be good enough on just grassland, I feel like you have to be able to start to identify club moss and bare ground and maybe some of the species in the picture. So it has to be a pretty good picture. It has to be pictures like we were taking into a three foot frame, only you're doing it with a drone. And as that, I, do, I don't know if people are doing that right now or not. Patty no. Oh, so go ahead, Martin. The, the, the sensing at best is to herbaceous versus perennial versus annual. Um, as far as like color readout and using different like sensors to gauge what a plant might be. So that would basically that would put crested wheatgrass and western wheatgrass in the same category. So and then the smaller the scale and the more precise of monitoring, the higher the cost. So that's kind of what has made drone monitoring prohibitive of it's not super precise, but it is super expensive. And then we've got Dale, and she's asking, Rick, how do you stop buckbrush from taking over? So I'm going to guess now that buckbrush is snowberry, probably. Gets a little white berries on it in August. Um, and usually where we see that become, so buckbrush or snowberry is rhizomatous. It spreads from roots underground. Uh, it's not spreading from seed. It is a shrub. It is a perennial shrub. It is native. Um, so it's not one that I would ever recommend that you spray. Um, typically, it grows in swales that maybe are the last places that the snow comes out of in the spring or down along your riparian areas, right? Um, usually, what's you so. What I try and get people to think about is, all right, if we if we know that about it, then why do we think it is so bad where it's at? Because it's not bad everywhere, right? You just have place here or there. And typically it's because the grass was getting used in that area at some time, significantly enough during the important 60 days. And maybe it was just a bad set of years. Um, two or three dry years in a row, and that was kind of a quote unquote sacrifice area, and the cows worked it over good. They're not real big on eating snowberry in the important 60 days because snowberry isn't doing very much then. Um, it doesn't really start growing until later in June that it puts on a lot of green leaf. And so basically um, my guess is past grazing activity has given the advantage to the snowberry or the buckbrush over the grass. What I typically do, and I didn't have any photos in my own life, those bad snowberry. So then what happens, let me explain this part, grass doesn't like shade. That's why underneath your trees in your yard, the grass doesn't want to come as well if it's a good bushy tree or bush. Um, grass wants direct sunlight. So snowberry, when it gets thick enough, all that's underneath of it is bare ground until the Canada thistle and the hound's tongue starts to grow up through it. And that's because those two things are shade tolerant, all right? So typically it goes from a light snowberry stand to a heavy snowberry stand. The grass goes completely out of it, becomes bare ground under it. The cows walk through it, whatever uh, weed seeds are sticking to their legs, brush off, fall to the ground, poof, you have a weed patch. I'll throw my salt tubs um, that kind of stuff in the thickest parts of it, and then I'll just move it around. Um, you don't have to do anything to help the cows find them. They're like bird dogs, and they will just make craters in that snowberry uh, 20, 30 feet around. I mean, if you have 100 acres, this would be a very slow process, and I get that. Um, but you can definitely, you don't have to wipe it out. I don't recommend wiping it out. I recommend opening it up to where you have good grass growth in it. It catches a lot of snow. The birds love it. Snowberry itself, the cows will use. Um, and so think about uh, protecting the grass during those important 60 days, grazing after. But when you graze that snowberry now that it's that dense, and I have had to do this, have to do this myself, um, do something so that the livestock will go in there and just wreak havoc on those snowberry stands 
and they op they'll open up immediately. It's amazing. The next year you'll have grass coming up in it. Yeah, and that's what she added. She says she's thinking of spreading out and removing the grassland. So that's, yeah, perfectly covered there. Any more questions for Rick before we call it a night this evening? All right, well, Angel's gonna go ahead and put our post-event survey into that meeting chat. And then also once I uh, have everything uploaded to our YouTube channel, I'll go ahead and email out this mailing list so that you can have a direct link and access to this information again, if you want to share it or rewatch anything. And um, Rick's contact information, if you've got any questions for him, can be found on our website, ranchstewards.org, as can Martin's, if you've got any questions that you want to direct to him. And uh, I know that both of those gentlemen would be happy to uh, follow up with you on those. So with that, Rick, thank you for joining us tonight. And Thanks this final Rural Resilience webinar for this year, we'll have that banking workshop coming up, bookkeeping workshop coming up in June. And you can find all those details on our website as well. And we'd love to hear your ideas for next year. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight.